Hi there and welcome to lab four. So in today's lab we're going to um, look at the concept of sampling and how sampling from a population um, gives rise to different samples. So each time we sample we're going to get a different set of observations in our sample. And what we really want to know is how we can characterize the variation that we see, so the uh, random variation we see from sample to sample, can we characterize that so that when we only have one sample we can get a feel for how much uncertainty is associated with that. The idea being that if we can get a measure of how much uh, uncertainty is associated with a single sample then we can say something about the entire population because we not only have kind of a best guess from our samples to what the population looks like but we also know sort of how much we expect our sample to be wrong therefore we can kind of calibrate um, against um, how much uh, sort of provide an estimate or a, a, a range of plausible values uh, for the population. So we're going to do that by taking um, a population of students at Massey University um, and we have three measures. We have their GPA, their grade point average between 0 and 9 inclusive. We have their age and years and um, the sex male and female as measured at Massey. So uh, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at this entire population which consists of almost 40,000 students and we're going to be taking samples from it and each time we take a sample we're going to get a different um, set of observations in that sample and so it's going to look a little bit different and our goal today is really to see how different are they and how does that relate to various properties of the sample and can we then use that to estimate things like um, you know if the uh, what statistics that we take from the sample, so for example the sample mean or the sample proportion, how does that change from sample to sample? Because what we'd expect is we'd expect the observations in the sample to differ from sample to sample, obviously you're going to choose different people each time you sample, but we might expect that the average age for example in the sample might not vary quite as much as the individual observations in the sample because we're averaging over many people and that averaging process is going to reduce the amount of uh, variation. So we're going to read in the, read in the data and uh, load up some, some kind of helper um, things today. And so here you can see here these are the first six rows of the data set Massey. You can see Massey has 38,675 observations on the three variables. And um, here's the first six rows. So you can see that this has been uh, rounded um, completely insanely. Okay, we think this person is 37.11024 years old, and that might give you a hint that perhaps this is synthetic data, right? This isn't the real data. Uh, Massey doesn't doesn't give me the GPA of every student, um, so this is synthetic data that I've um, created to be hopefully somewhat representative of what the um, age distribution might look like at Massey, um, but it's not going to be exact in any um, because it's not the real data. But nonetheless, we've got a population. And so we're going to uh, look at how that uh, population is distributed. And we're going to start with the sample proportion. So we're going to assess um, the true proportion of females in the population. So we're going to plot the, all the data, the Massey data, and work out the proportion. So we've got a function here, proportion, to work out the proportion of females. Okay, so you can see here from the graph that there's a higher proportion of females than males at Massey. I think that holds in the population as well. And if we have a look at the output from the, um, from the proportion, we can see that the proportion is 0.5287. So roughly 53% of students at Massey are female. So that's what the population looks like. So we'll remember that number there, roughly 53%, and that graph there. And then, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a sample from that population um, and work out the corresponding proportion of females in the sample and see how that compares um, to what we have in the population. So um, this next one is taking a sample of size 20. Okay, so you see sample here has 20 observations. We could click on it and have a look. There they are. Okay, we've got another column here just saying this is the first sample we've taken. That's all that means. So we've just picked 20 20. Um, 20 people, so you can see that we've picked item 6, item 6,642, and so on, right, at random through the data. And we can see that when we look at the proportion of females here, it's slightly higher, isn't it, uh, than it was in the population. So here's the population, they were closer to being the same, and in our sample, it was a little bit different. Okay, and the proportion in our sample was 
we remember in the population it's 53 percent okay and uh, we could pretty we could um you know run that code again and we're going to get a different sample aren't we so we'll run the code again and now it's reversed so now we have more males than females in this particular sample so we have 11 males and nine females so the proportion of females 45 percent and each time we run this block we're going to get a different sample okay and this is just random sample to sample variation that you would expect if you take random samples this is what you expect in a sample of size 20 if you take random samples okay so um, the next code block here is just repeating that process 20 times automatically just so that we can compare the samples all at once so uh, if we if we run that then we're going to take 20 samples of size 20 so that's the size and that's the number of samples we're taking and here's our 20 samples and we've plotted the proportion in each of them and you can see they vary quite a bit right so in this first sample we had 14 females and only six males right so the proportion there is going to be 0.7 right 70 percent um, whereas in some of the others it was around the other way um, so uh, so in this one here we had 15 males and only five females right just due to chance just due to the sampling process so you can see there's quite a bit of variation from sample to sample and we can summarize the proportion so you can have a look at the proportions that we've got okay so here's the the sample and here's the proportion in each sample so you can see we got that 0 0.7 there from that first sample and in the lowest sample we had 0.25 right so we only had five females out of 20 which is 25 percent okay so there's quite a bit of variation in the proportions and if we summarize that here we can see that on average the mean of the proportions across the 20 samples so we take those 20 samples of size 20 work out the proportion in each okay the smallest proportion of females was 25 percent and the highest proportion was 70 percent and the average of the proportions is about 51 percent which is pretty close to the actual proportion in the population right which was 52 percent uh, we could go further by taking a thousand samples of size 20 just to see how much variation we can get and now and because we've got a thousand it's not really feasible to visualize them all let's perhaps just run that again this code block just to see um, what variation we might get right so here's a different 20 samples okay so the first one now is 50 50 okay and again if we look at the average across those samples it's 54 percent so the average proportion across our 20 samples is 54 percent so the next code block down here just takes this further by taking a thousand samples right so when we do our thousand samples we're going to compute the proportion for each sample so we're going to take 1000 samples of size 20 then across those thousand samples we're going to compute the proportion and then we're going to summarize the proportion um, using the summary so that we can get the mean the minimum and the maximum and so on and we're also going to summarize it in a, in a histogram okay so here's the summary so the smallest proportion in our samples of size 20 we took a thousand of them was 15 percent which would have been just three out of 20 females in our sample and the highest proportion was 90 percent which is 18 out of 20. when you run it you may get different numbers right because we're randomly sampling but that gives you an idea of the range and you can see that the mean the average of the proportions is 53 percent which is very similar to the mean in the population and here's the distribution so you can see here that um, up here somewhere it's the truth and you can see that in our samples they vary quite a bit so this is the one that's down at 15 percent and this is the one that's up at 90 percent okay um, and and all of them are, are lie between that but most of them are gathered around the truth okay so when we take samples most of them are representative some of them are extreme and the shape of the proportions that we get from repeated sampling is this nice kind of bell shape curve so it's symmetric it's centered on the true value of the proportion in the population but there's some spread associated with it okay and we're going to use that spread to figure out how much uncertainty we get when we have a single sample so the problem with a single sample of course is we don't know whether we're down here at this extreme sample therefore we're far away from the truth and too low or we might be up here and have another extreme sample which is far away from the truth and too high and we're not going to know when we have that one sample right 
because we don't know what the truth is. That's the whole point. We're trying to guess the truth. We don't know with a particular sample whether it's a typical one or an extreme one. But what we do know is that most of the samples we have are typical. So they're mostly in a fairly narrow range, and it's only every now and then that we get an extreme one. So we can characterize the uncertainty based on what we expect most of the time. Okay, and in fact, we can we can say exactly how uncertain we are. So um, we'll see how that happens in a, um, in the next few lectures. So that was samples of size twenty, and as you'd expect, a sample of size twenty is not going to be um, particularly good at capturing the variation in a proportion. Presumably, if we increase the sample size, then each of our particular samples will look more like the population, because we've captured more people. And therefore, the proportion will be more similar to the um, proportion in the population. Again, because we've just captured more people. So the sample to sample variation will be will be less. Okay, so we're going to have a look at this here. So we're going to take a thousand samples of size 20, then a thousand samples of size 80, and then a thousand samples of size 320. So each time we're quadrupling the sample size. So we start off with 20, we multiply by 4, we get 80. We multiply by 4 again and we get 320. Right? And then for each sample, we're going to compute the sample proportion. So the proportion of females in each sample. So we'll have 1,000 proportions from samples of size 20. We'll have 1,000 proportions from samples of size 80. And 1,000 proportions from samples of size 320. Then we're going to combine them all together and plot with a histogram. So this will take a little bit of time to run. There we go. So these are our samples of size 20, which we had before. And you can see we have a similar sort of variation, although I think, uh, yeah, so 0.15 up to up to point, almost 0.9. Again, they're centered on the truth, but there's a lot of spread. And you can see that as I go to samples of size 80, then again, they're centered on the truth, right? The true proportion is 52, uh, 53%. So they're centered there, but the spread, the range of the sample proportions is much less because our sample size is bigger, right? So our sample size is bigger, so each each sample looks more like the truth, looks more like the population, simply because we've sampled more people, okay? Um, therefore, the proportions are closer to the truth, so they don't vary as much from sample to sample. And the same when we go to 320, okay? And what you'll notice here is that sort of the range of proportions we get roughly halves between the 20 and 80 case, and roughly halves again between the 80 and 320. So by quadrupling the sample size, we halve the spread. Okay, so I'm just going to write a, a, a few notes about this uh, further up, just so that we've got a record for later. Okay, so... Right, so... True proportion is 53 okay uh, so here each time we take a sample we capture Okay, uh, so let's just document this. So, taking 20 samples, um, we can capture some of that variation. 
Okay. So larger sample sizes show that as we quadruple the sample size, the spread uh, or range of, of possible proportions um, roughly halves. So each sample is closer to the truth. This makes sense as we're capturing more individuals. Okay, and we'll notice that the same thing happens when we look at the sample mean. So let's look at the ages. Here's the age distribution. So you can see that most people at Massey are, are young, sort of in their um, late teens, early 20s. Um, but some are, some are old. So for example, I have a PhD student that's in his 70s. Um, and he's decided he wants to do a PhD. So he works at Statistics New Zealand. Um, and the average age is 28, okay? And that's mostly because, of course, it's skewed to the right, right? So the median age is probably a more representative age in this case, um, but nonetheless, we're gonna be looking at the average. Um, but simply because the um, uncertainty process for averages is a little bit nicer. Okay, so we're gonna re re uh, repeat the process. We're gonna take our 20 samples of size 20 and plot each of them. So you can see that um, the, the histograms here don't look all that mu much like this one. Um, because they're quite small samples, right? We've got a sample of size 20, so the, the variation is is um, going to be quite high. Uh, but none, nonetheless, they look sort of the same, don't they? Right? In that they, they all look kind of skewed to the right. It's a little bit hard to tell with the low sample size. And if we look at the means that we get, the sample means, then we can see that they range from 23.6 up to 33. You remember the truth was 28.5, okay? And you can see that the average of them is about the truth, right? So again, the sample means are centered on the truth and have some spread about them. Okay, and we're gonna repeat the process here, just like we did before, we're gonna take samples of size 1,000, uh, sorry, samples of size 20, 80, and 320. We're gonna repeat it 1,000 times just so we can see the uncertainty in the sampling process. Okay, right, so what we've plotted here, so we've taken our samples, we've worked out the sample mean from each one, we could look at those, so here's the sample means of size 20, so here's the average age in each of those samples, so you can see there's quite a bit of variation, okay, and I've just done a histogram of them here, right, so this here is a histogram of those um, 1,000 samples um, of the sample mean, so you can see that again they're centered on about the truth 28.5 but they have some spread some uncertainty associated with them right and when we take a single sample again we don't know whether we're going to be in one of these extreme ones whether where the average inside the sample is going to be you know 24 years or maybe the average is going to be 34 years we don't know with a single sample but what we do know is that most of the samples are going to be within the range you know maybe 25 to to 31 or so okay so that's what we would expect that's how much uncertainty we would expect. And again, we notice that as we increase the sample size, the range of possible values for the sample mean reduces. Right, so, and it reduces by about half. Okay, and a quadrupling the sample size again has that same reduction by about half. Okay, so um, in each case, i.e. regardless, of sample size, repeated sampling shows us that the mean of each sample is distributed such uh, um, centered on the true population mean. Okay, uh, the sample size affects how much spread there is around the truth. With small samples, we have a lot of spread. As each sample has fewer individuals, in it, thus um, more potential to be odd.
larger samples cover more of the population, thus typically uh, more representative. So less extreme. Uh, quadrupling the sample size reduces the uh, range of possible sample means by two. So you can kind of see that there's going to be diminishing returns here, right? So in order to um, reduce the um, the range at which samples can take, and therefore to reduce the uncertainty that we're going to have about what the truth is, um, um, by two, so in order to halve the amount of uncertainty, we have to quadruple the sample size. Okay, so um, you quickly start um, it quickly becomes very expensive um, if you want to be re very accurate because you you know each time you kind of halve the amount of uncertainty that you have you've got to quadruple the sample size so it it um, quickly can get out of hand um, and um, and so there's a trade-off there and so it turns out that these that basically in both cases we get the same distribution right so we get this nice bell-shaped distribution for proportions and we get this nice bell shape um, for means, right? For um, for the sample means. And notice that this bell shape has nothing to do with the shape of the data, right? The data was shaped like this. It was definitely not symmetric, and the samples were definitely not symmetric, right? But the the means, the sample means, the distribution of the sample mean was symmetric. The distribution of the sample proportion was symmetric. So the nice thing about that is that um, that once we know how to deal with this nice symmetric distribution here, which some of you might recognize as a normal distribution, once we know how to deal with that and how, and how to figure out you know, how much spread it has given the sample size, then we can deal with any distribution, right? Because it doesn't depend on the distribution of the population. All it depends on is essentially the sampling process. So, this, so there's something kind of inherent about taking random samples and sample to sample variation that results in this nice normal distribution. So there's some underlying theory that sort of holds um, essentially always. Um, and so once we understand that theory and can use that theory, we can take advantage of it to characterize the uncertainty, even if we've only got one sample. So obviously in practice, we're not going to take a thousand samples. Uh, what would be the point, right? You, instead of taking a thousand samples, it would be much better just, just to take one really big one. So in general, we'll only have one sample of a particular size, but nonetheless, using the information we have here, that we've gleaned here, we know that the, 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 um, the distribution of potential sample means will be centered on the truth and have a particular spread. So we know that, you know, well, so we might be down here or we might be up here, we might be extreme, but we know we're not extreme very frequently. So we can characterize kind of the potential range for the truth working backwards from our sample. Okay, so in this process we've worked forwards, we've taken our population, repeatedly sampled, worked out how the sample mean will change, so how the sample means vary. But with a single sample, we can kind of go backwards, right? We can say, well, the single sample could be down here, or it could be up here, but either way, it's sort of plus or minus two from the truth, right? So if we go about plus or minus two from our sample, we're likely to capture the truth. That's the idea. We'll look at that a little bit more in the lectures.